Last September, I had my 94th birthday. All right. And I'm a little bit like the guy that went to the doctor. And he said, Doctor, if I give up drinking, smoking, and women, will I live longer? The doctor said, no, but it'll seem a hell of a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> we had an old gentleman up. I'm from Michigan. I have to tell you that Michigan has an unusual climate. We have seven months of, of winter and five months of poor sledding up there. <laughs> <laughs> this old gentleman up there went to the doctor and the, uh, the doctor examined him and he said, well, you look pretty good. The man says, no, no, I, that's true. He says, I, I can't see very good. He said, I love to play golf and I can't see where the ball goes. The doctor says, no problem. He said, I've got another old gentleman who loves to play golf. He's got perfect eyesight. We just put you two together and you go out and play ball together. So they did, they went out there and the first guy hits the ball quite a ways away and he said, can you see it, can you see it? The guy says, oh yes, I can see it. He said, where did you go? He says, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, why am I here? Uh, I spent the years 1942 to 1946 in the U.S. Army. It took me many different places. Uh, I was born on a farm in southern Michigan, General Farm. Uh, I started <laughs> kindergarten in 1929. <laughs> One month later, the stock market crashed in New York and started a depression, which I had nothing to do with. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. <laughs> uh, we had entered in through 10 years of very severe depression. Uh, no, nothing like it recently. Uh, between 1930 and 1933, 5,800 banks closed their doors. They lent money out on mortgages. People couldn't pay. People, the depositors wanted their money. They closed their doors. On our farm, the Wabash Railroad, the double track Wabash Railroad, went across one end of the farm. Not one freight train went ever down there unless there was at least 10 or 15 what they called hobos riding the rails, looking for work. My grandmother was a Civil War widow and she had her money in the People's State Bank of Milan, Michigan. The bank went bankrupt. She ended up getting 17 cents on the dollar of her deposits. So, uh, Churchill once said that uh, people who do not know history are bound to repeat it. There's some truth to that. Uh, I wonder if these days, uh, if we were analyzing what's happened in relationship to the past. Um, two reasons I'm here. There, at the end, middle of 1944, there were 13 million people in the armed forces of the United States. Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, um, uh, Women's Army Corps, and so on. Uh, today, there's less than one million left. They say they're dying at the rate of 300 a day. So there are not many people left to speak for them. Uh, uh, when I was a little boy, my father used to take me down to a little town where there was an old gentleman who lived there who had a long white beard. He was known to me as Uncle Billy Losey. And uh, Uncle Billy, when he was a young man in 1860, uh, the war, Civil War came on, he enlisted in the 24th Michigan Infantry, which became Army of the Potomac. Uh, uh, <clears throat> after the Battle of Chancellorville, the, uh, the Army marched north, staying between Lee and Washington, and uh, it was what they called the Iron Brigade, uh, made up of the 24th Michigan, the 19th Indiana, and the 83rd Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, they, they were the first troops to meet the Confederates at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The Confederate Army never intended to go to Pennsylvania, except the uh, Confederate soldiers' shoes were so bad, <laughs> they heard there was a shoe factory in, in uh, Gettysburg. So one Army Corps was diverted to go through, uh, and there they met the 24th Michigan and uh, a cavalry unit. On the first, Uncle Billy was wounded on the first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, shot in the leg. He, uh, all during the three-day battle, he lay behind the Confederate lines in a barn. And when the, and the Confederates moved out after the battle, they left him there, and so on. I sat on his lap. I used to sit on his lap and feel the mini ball in his leg. He never had it removed. 
but they said that the reason was he was afraid he'd lose his pension. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, see, uh, I'm sitting here and I sat, sat on the lap of somebody wounded at the Battle of Gettysburg. Maybe some of you will someday remember somebody that was in Normandy, Omaha Beach and so on. That was myself. There's another reason that when I was in the second grade in school there in Michigan, the Depression had already set, set in pretty, pretty hard. Now, in, 19, in the Depression of the 30s, the employment rate was, unemployment rate is from 28 to 30 percent. And that didn't count the people who only work, working one or two days a week. On our farm, which we uh, had plenty to eat, of course, but you couldn't sell anything. Eggs were five cents a dozen. I've got a record book that shows my dad sent four 200-pound hogs into the stockyards in Detroit, and we got $22 for the four hogs, so on. I only mention this because this is, uh, 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 somebody wrote a book about the greatest generation. Tom Brokaw. Tom Brokaw. I only mention these things because this is, this tells a lot about the men that fought World War II. This is where they came from. Most of them, I think the average age of American soldiers was probably 23, 24, 25. I was 19, uh, going on 20, and so on. But when I was in the second grade there, uh, the Depression had really hit. And there's a little boy, his name was Robert Bloom, that sat <laughs> next to me. And his, he used to bring his lunch, and his sandwiches were two slices of bread with lard. Oh. Lard. And uh, I, <laughs> I told my mother, and she started to pack. Uh, we carried our lunch, and then school provided milk. And I told my mother, so she started to put in extra sandwiches. Oh. And, uh, I, I gave him to him, <laughs> and I noticed that he wasn't eating all of them. I said, don't you like this? He said, no, I'm keeping them for my little sister back home. <laughs> that boy was killed in Normandy. And <laughs> pardon me. So there's nobody here to speak for him, <laughs> except me or <laughs> somebody else. Uh, I, I had finished my first, uh, I was in high college for the first year when the Pearl Harbor attack. <clears throat> and I had registered for the draft uh, in 1941, August, uh, September 41, when I became 18. But I wanted to finish that first year of college to prove to myself that I could do it, you know. Uh, I had been a rather indifferent student in high school. I, I like history and government and economics. Uh, but the rest of it, I went math and sci uh, some of the other things, I wasn't too crazy about. I majored in baseball, football, and, and uh, <laughs> uh, basketball. <laughs> and, uh, um, but uh, we f I finished that first year. I, I went to work in, a wo in the Willow Run bomber plant. They had just built a new mile and a quarter long bomber plant outside Detroit. <laughs> and uh, they were going to uh, build bombers. They were a B-24 bomber, which had been developed by Consolidated and Volte in uh, San Diego, and they sent, going to be run by Henry Ford, and they sent three car, uh, boxcar loads of blueprints. Now I tell you, these men that work, people are going to work in that plant never even saw a plane that side, let alone build one, you know. This is a big four-engine bomber, uh, like, like somewhat like the B-17. And but let me tell you this, before that war was over, that plant was turning one, out one B-24 every hour. Wow. They built 7,200 and some bombers there during the war. I say this to pay the tribute to the American people, the, uh, the people back home. Henry Kaiser had shipyards up and down the West Coast. He built 22,700 10,000 ton Liberty ships, 700 victory ships, cargo ships, uh, uh, women, riveters and everything. And, uh, uh, the only difference between the two was that one of the victory the Liberty ships had a uh, um, oil-fired boiler, and the victory ships had a, uh, a diesel engines running generators. That was the only difference. Uh, <laughs> um, the productivity of the American people. We built 100,000 Sherman tanks. I, I mean, uh, all together, and so on. Even the Russian army was equipped with Sherman tanks to some degree, and so on. Uh, so it's not wasn't just us uh, in uh, the army, uh, soldiers, but there's the American people. I, uh, the country was absolutely united 
uh, if you're trying to hitchhike a little bit, people pick you up right away. I was in Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana, on a go home to Michigan on a three-day pass. I stepped outside the gate, the, <laughs> the gate of Fort Benjamin, a truck driver picked me up, took me to Anderson, Indiana, a couple that worked for uh, the uh, Allison Division of General Motors picked me up and took me to Michigan. <laughs> I was home by the next morning and so on, and bought my dinner and so on. Uh, so that, that's kind of the background. Well, uh, when I finished that college, uh, we, three of us went to the draft board in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for our county, and they said, when are you going to call us? They said, we don't know. We get orders from Chicago, Fort Benjamin, Fort Harrison, or Fort Sheridan, send 75 men. So we take them <coughs> off the top. Uh, what are we going to do? I don't know whether to get ready to go back to school or what, you know. And uh, my uncle, who was a supervisor of a township, said, uh, why don't you go see the county school commissioner? He's having trouble getting teachers for these one-room schools. So I went to see him, and he said, boy, <laughs> I'm glad to see you. I got a, a, a one-room school down there next to you. That we, the women, the former women teachers, are going over to the bomber plant and making more money. He said, would you take that school? I went to see the chairman of their school board. They had a three-man school board. And he said, if you could just come and get the school started. I told him I'm going to be called any time. In the meantime, I got a notice to report to uh, Fort Grand, Camp Grand, Illinois on the 11th of October. But I went there for, and taught that school for six weeks. I had 19 students. And <laughs> one, one little kindergarten girl. Uh, <laughs> I tell you, we had great recesses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the mothers come in, make popcorn and eat it soup, you know, just a typical one-room wooden school, you know. And, uh, but I knew I wasn't going to be there very long. Uh, when the 11th, the, the day before the, I was to leave, I went home and uh, uh, I noticed a, a, a car in the driveway of the farm, and uh, it was our minister. And he had come to say goodbye. <laughs> And he, he gave me a little Bible, a little testament, which I forgot to bring with me today. And, uh, and I carried that all through the war in my field jacket pocket. It's been a well-traveled little Bible because it's crossed the Atlantic Ocean 10 times and the Pacific 8 times as mm -hmm. <laughs> a, a, a civilian, you know, and so on. Well, uh, that finally that draft board said, well, we didn't tell you one thing, that you could volunteer for induction. And I said, what's that mean? He said, you tell us you're ready to volunteer, and the next group of people we sent, we'll put you with them. So two of my friends go with me. We, we went together. Mm -hmm. And one of the women made up a big box of sandwiches. I think they thought the army wouldn't feed us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we get on the train to Ann Arbor, Michigan. We go to Chicago, and then on to Rockford, Illinois. And that's Camp Grant there. There's two parts to it, the uh, Recruit Induction Center and the main part of the camp. And here's up these men, they give us shots, they take up civilian clothes and we pack them up, send them home. We go through and get new, different clothing and, uh, you know, a typical entrance into the army. Uh, one, of, one of them was to, uh, uh, there was a bunch of uh, not coms sitting there at a table and you could go and sit down there. And uh, I sat down and he said, well, where are you from, what would you do? I said, well, I'm a farm boy, I've been to college one year and I drove a school bus. And, uh, he puts down the number 314. I said, what does that mean? He says, light truck and ambulance driver. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's the beginning of our military career. <clears throat> but every day they're calling out men's names from these barracks, and 10 of them, they say, you're going to, to Fort Stewart, Georgia. Then they call out another 10, you're going to Camp Robinson, Arkansas. It ends up there's just two of us left in that barracks. A Polish kid from Chicago and me. And he says, you know, I think we're going to stay right here in Camp Grant. You know, he was, he wanted, uh, I talked to him and he wanted to be a doctor someday. And it turned out that the rest of that Camp Grant was a medical training center for med you know, Army medics. So a couple of days later, we grab our bags and, put, and we walk about a half mile over to Camp Grant, the main part of the camp. And uh, three days later, we turned our a lot of other men came in. I'm in a barracks with 50 men, and uh, we started our training. Now, the basic training in the medics was the same as anywhere else, but we didn't shoot very much. We didn't go to the rifle range and shoot. 
because uh, that's not going to be our job. What we did was to practice uh, e evacuating casualties, uh, ra wrapping their jeep up with a big canvas and floating it across <coughs> the Rock River, the Rock River, uh, and, and things that medics normally do. Now, uh, we go out to bivouac in, in the bivouac area, and uh, my job with that was to pick out some half a dozen guys to be casualties. They go out and hide, see? And uh, then the medics go out and find them and treat them. Then we, they would put a little sign on with shot through the liver or something. And uh, they were, these guys were pretty smart. When the medics would start coming, they could hear them. They'd run further and deeper in the woods. They <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to be found. They could doze off out there all day, I guess. But it was the, the training we, we was good. Uh, I mean, it was uh, when I went in there, I weighed 148 pounds. When the uh, 10 weeks were over, I had gained, uh, I was 164. So the food was good, uh, the cooks were good. Uh, uh, the sergeant and corporal in my barracks were very fine people. This, uh, my excuse, uh, kind of this idea that the soldiers are uh, military, uh, that some sergeant is yelling at them all the time, uh, that's, not, that's not my experience. These guys were very good. They told us right at the beginning, they said, uh, keep your nose clean and don't cause us a whole lot of trouble and you'll be all right. I never had any trouble uh, with anybody uh, that, there. Now, towards the end of this uh, uh, basic training, uh, I got a notice to go to a building to be interviewed. Now, I had one year of college, remember, and I went to this and there were three officers there on a table and a chair and they said, sit down. And, uh, you know, and they asked me a lot of questions. Did you take algebra? Did you take this? Uh, and so on. And they didn't tell me anything about wh what this was for. Uh, I didn't ask them. Uh, I figured if I, they needed to know, they would have told me. Uh, when the basic training is over, they're shipping out men from my barracks all over the place, Fort Stewart, Georgia, and, uh, Camp Robinson. I don't remember where they're going. But about five of us uh, were still there. And they said, uh, uh, three or four days later, you have your bag ready, you're going to go uh, to Champaign, Illinois. So we get on the train, we go to Chicago, and then down to Champaign. And uh, uh, we're now in a program called ASTP, Army Specialist Training Program. And uh, uh, so <laughs> whatever you want to Special, specialized train for. We didn't do anything there, but a few days later they took, put us on another train. We went back to Chicago, to the University of Chicago. And I found out that I was uh, assigned to a medical unit uh, in which the purpose of it was to get ready to, to go back into Europe when everything would be in chaos, buildings would be blown up, and uh, try to take care of the civilians, you know. Uh, the Army did not want the job of uh, taking care of women having babies and uh, all the different things that civilians might be doing. <coughs> We're supposed to work with the French to take care of it, get them off the Army's back. But the problem was, and we asked them questions, uh, okay, we go in there uh, and the hospital's blown up, where do we get the jet, where do we get the stuff to fix it? They didn't have any answers. I mean, they, <laughs> and after, uh, more questions we asked, the less answers we got. It was obvious that these people didn't know what the whole thing was going to be. And finally, uh, after about six weeks, they come in, they kind of smiling. They said, you know, we aren't going to do that. The French, the French, uh, John de Gaulle and the three French, are, have signed an agreement in which they're going to go back in. So that's the end of that program. <laughs> now, I knew from my experience that there's, wherever you were in the Army, there's only two ways to get out of there and you know, go somewhere else. And that was one was to volunteer for the paratroops. And I couldn't vision myself up there about 8,000 feet jumping out in a parachute that <laughs> some other GI had rigged. <laughs> and the second thing was you could volunteer as an aviation cadet. In downtown in Chicago, there was an office. So I went down there, and they checked my eyes and hearing and everything, and they said, well, you qualify go back to your office there at the University of Chicago and we'll, we'll call you. So a week or two later, they, there's two or three other guys there, and uh, we get on a, they took us to the station, we get on a train, and there's a Pullman, a Pullman 
you know, you got bunk, you got beds. And uh, uh, we, I woke up the next morning in Cincinnati. And uh, we're going to my, we're on our way to Miami, Florida, to the Air Force. And uh, uh, next night we're on there. I still had this lower bunk of the Pullman, which is the best one. And there was a young lieutenant there, and uh, his, young, his young wife, and I swear they probably had been married about a week. And uh, they, he got the upper bunk, <laughs> <laughs> which is a, about a foot narrower, see? <laughs> and that lieutenant come over to me and he says, soldier, he says, what would it, how much, what would it cost to get that lower bunk? <laughs> I said, sir, you don't, I, you don't have to pay me nothing. You take the lower bunk and so on. So I, in my war experience, I contributed to the marital uh, uh, <laughs> 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 young lieutenant and his wife. <laughs> I, I never saw him again. <laughs> uh, but we get down to Miami and we we were in a hotel right on uh, Miami Beach. You know, beautiful there, sun shining. You know, and uh, hot, quite warm. And uh, uh, we went, went through all the tests and. Uh, they said I passed, and these are even psychological tests. <laughs> and uh, uh, so they said, you're gonna go to uh, East Tennessee State College for pre-flight training, all right? Uh, but we didn't go, and it ran along a few days, and we began to ask questions. Then an officer came in and he said, I wanna talk to the men who came from other units other than the Air Force. You're not gonna be, you're gonna be in the aviation cadet. Only the men from the Air Force are going to stay. The rest of you will go back to somewhere where you came from. Well, where did I come from? <laughs> I don't know. And uh, I, I, I never was attached to a real medical unit that, you know, that did uh, that type. And uh, uh, <clears throat> then they came in and they said, well, have you ready to go tomorrow morning? You're going to go to Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Uh, the second infantry division there is being moved to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin for cold weather training, and then you're going to set up a new field hospital, and that's where you're going to be with them. Now, uh, we got on the train, we went up to Atlanta, and uh, we had to change trains there, and uh, <clears throat> I ran into my first experience with segregation, in a way. Uh, I had to wait two hours to change trains, and I went out and got something to drink or a sandwich or something, I came back, and I sat down in the waiting room a waiting room. And uh, in the north where we are, uh, everybody's in the waiting room, white, red, green, anybody sits there, you know. And I just sat down, we're sitting there, and uh, somebody's jabbing me in the shoulder, and I look up and there's a big Atlanta policeman. And he's poking me in the shoulder and he said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm waiting for a train to go to Texas. He says, get over on the other side where you belong. I was in the black waiting room. That was my first experience with segregation and so on, but, and so on. Uh, we got to Fort Sam Houston, Texas, hot, hot, hot. We get off the train and go in this headquarters and they said, don't unpack your bag. The whole division is being transferred to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin <laughs> for cold weather training. I said, I'll tell you one thing, I, we're not going to go up to South Pacific. <laughs> they are getting cold weather trained to go to the South Pacific. Yeah. My brother's already down there and he's sweating and, and malaria is chewing on him and so on. Well, we get up to Camp McCoy, Wisconsin after Illinois Central two, <coughs> two or three night trip up there. And uh, uh, we took these medics and they said, you're, you're now in a new field hospital that's being set up, which is going to be the 49th field hospital. There's no officers, no nurses, no doctors, nothing. Just about uh, 50 men. There were some other men there from come some other place. And uh, we got a sergeant uh, who's in charge of us. And I think he came out of the hills of Arkansas or someplace. I, I don't know. <laughs> he had a one-track mind. And that was the only thing you think of to do was put on your full field pack every day and your entrenching tool and march through the woods for about 25 miles. <laughs> Of course, you stopped every, every hour for 10 minutes for a smoke break, you know. But every, you know, you'd get tired of marching through the wood. It was, it was nice there. The deer would run across, you know. This is a big, a big camp there. And uh, the deer would run across and so on. But after about a week, I, I, uh, 
I said, yeah, there must be something else we can do around here. I could go and work in the station hospital or something, you know, but not that sergeant. He's, he, <laughs> he got us out there every morning with 30 pound pack, you know, and we marched. So one night I go over to the PX, and uh, because you can get a pint of ice cream there for 10 cents. Everything in the PX, you know, is government furnished or something. And uh, I got my ice cream and it was kind of crowded, but I sat down to this table where there was one chair vacant and eating my ice cream. And a, a, a technical sergeant came in, that's the second highest interest in rank, and he said, can I sit down with you? <laughs> and I said, yes. This was my first meeting with a rather remarkable man, a fellow, uh, Sergeant Blasco, was from New Jersey, uh, John Blasco. He had been two years in Marquette University Medical School in Milwaukee. Uh, and he had an unhappy romance, and he said to heck with it, and he joined the Army. And then right, right away they put him in the medical corps. And uh, he's asking me questions, what do you, where'd you come from, what do you do, and so on. And I said, well, the only thing I know is I like to get away from that sergeant over there that's marching us through the woods for 20 miles every day. He says, uh, will you, can you come over and see Captain uh, Bylan? I said, who's Captain Bylan? Well, he's going to be a battalion surgeon of one of these battalions here in uh, Camp uh, here. So I go over and see uh, Captain Bylan, who was a, a, a small town doctor, really, from Missouri. A nice gentleman, very quiet, and he's asking me questions and looking me over. <laughs> At the end of this, he said, I want you to come with me. He said, I, I think we'll train you as a surgical technician. And I said, <laughs> I'm going to go out smiling, because I'm going to go back and tell that sergeant goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Which I did. And he was not too happy. And I said, I, 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 from now on, I have to go and report to Captain Byland and Sergeant Blasco every day. So uh, after a few days, he said, Mr. Uh, Brown, he said, I need to send you to Fort Benjamin Harrison, in Indiana, to be trained as a surgical technician. He said, in the battalion aid station, you will assist me with the first one, to, uh, with the wounded, and so on. So I go down to Fort Benjamin Harrison, which is an old army camp named after Civil War general, and uh, there's a big army hospital there, Buildings General Hospital. It's already got wounded from the South Pacific <coughs> and Italy and Africa and so on. And we trained, uh, I trained there as a surgical technician. Uh, one, one, three, four days I'm in the operating room. Uh, next three or four days I'm taking care of a soldier that panicked somewhere and got a bullet through the chest. We got him in a, in a uh, oxygen tent. I got to keep ice cubes in there and so on. Uh, uh, well, in the operating room, I never been in an operating room. I did have my tonsils taken out one time. Uh, <laughs> But uh, they brought a soldier in from a for, uh, camp uh, near there who had uh, somehow or other torn the ligaments in his knee. And they were gonna open up his knee and attach these ligaments. Now I and another soldier, I, we have scrubbed up but we're standing over here while the army nurse and the doctor and the surgeon are gonna do this. And they did, they opened the knee up about four inches above the knee and the four inches below and uh, uh, did their, what they had to do, but then, <laughs> then they started to take off their gowns and there's then they turned to this guy and I, they said, suture him up. <laughs> <laughs> suture him up, and they took off. <laughs> now, I, we had had a little practice on a, a rubber dummy. So on. But this other guy and I, <laughs> We sutured him up. <laughs> <laughs> he, he worked, he had, we were full to get, uh, you know, the skin is pretty tough, you know, you. And uh, <laughs> that guy was around, he, he had a strange looking knee, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but he did it. Uh, this was a uh, very good training. Uh, uh, and when I left there, I, I, I was prepared to really assist a battalion surgeon. We went back to Camp McCoy uh, and found out that we'd already been alerted for overseas movement. Then we were told we, could, we were going to have a seven to ten day furlough. I would, uh, <laughs> yeah, these guys, from, uh, they, if they lived in Illinois, they tell them that they need five days travel. You know, so they give them five days extra. 
I was stupid. I told him I only need two days, one day to come and go. I should have told him I was from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> it was too hard. And, and uh, uh, anyway, I went home on furlough. And, you know, I didn't tell you too much about going overseas, but I saw my family. And uh, I had a sister, one sister. She worked in the University of Michigan Hospital in Ann Arbor. And I saw her, was with her. When I bid her goodbye to leave, I did not know that that was the last time I would ever see her. She, uh, she died in May of 1945, when towards the end of the war. We had been moved on the move for six weeks. The, note, the, tele, uh, the cablegram I got said that she had died six weeks before. Mm -hmm. But that's life. And uh, uh, we're, we're learning for overseas movement. We go to uh, Massachusetts by train. Yeah, my job was to get a couple of medics on every train. A train would hold about 500 soldiers. And I had to get uh, uh, medics on there with a big first aid kit. Most, <laughs> mostly to treat hangovers, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, on my train, the train I went on, they sent word back that uh, there's a soldier up in the front in the car He's all doubled over, and uh, I wish you'd go up there and see him. I went up there, and it was obvious to me that he had a attack of appendicitis. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's all doubled up, the pain is here and so on. And uh, this train is going across southern Michigan at this time, towards Port Huron and Sandy, Ontario. We're going to go across Canada. And uh, uh, the train commander was a major. I said to him, I said, there's a man here who's got, I'm sure he has appendicitis attack. What are we going to do with it? He looks at his, <laughs> goes through his papers, and he said, we can drop him off to the Canadian Army in uh -huh. London, Ontario. So we, we went on to uh, Port Huron, which is on the river, and Sandy, Ontario is just across, and, and London, Ontario is 100 miles further. And sure enough, when we got to London, Ontario, here's the Canadian Army ambulance, and we turned him over to him, turned over to them. I saw him later in England. I saw him later in England uh, after he recovered and so on. So, but uh, we go on, we go, we go to Camp Mile Standish, which is a staging area for Boston, for <coughs> embarkation. This is where the men come to get ready to go on the troop ships and so on. Uh, I, did, I was a corporal by this time, so I didn't have to pull KP, but uh, I didn't have anything else to do. And I said, uh, could I work in the mess hall? I mean, could I go? I said, yeah. I went over there at 5 o'clock in the morning and did nothing but pour coffee <laughs> from 5 in the morning till 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. They had three big coffee makers. You know, they fed 5,000 so cold in that one mess hall. And uh, the <laughs> one of them would get empty. The guy would come along with a 20-pound bag of coffee and throw it in the top and turn on the steam heat, you know, and you got more coffee. But uh, that was all right. I, I did go into Boston one night and uh, looked around and uh, by the docks. I didn't see any big troop ship. And I went down to Providence one night because a, a friend of mine had to attend Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. But, you know, just down there and back. And then they told us, be ready to, we're going to, you're going to go get on the troop ship. So we get on a train and go up to, towards Boston. <coughs> There were a lot of factories along the railroad, and I think they were, you know, shoe factories. And all these women who were working there had their heads out the windows, you know, <laughs> waving at the train the troops going by. I suppose they did that every day all. And uh, we pull into uh, Atlantic Avenue and the docks of Boston, and here's this gigantic 35,000 ton troop ship, the USS West Point. They all camouflaged, you know, painted with camouflage. And uh, make a long story short, uh, we, we had 7,700 troops on there and 200 army nurses up in the top, guarded by the MPs. <laughs> <laughs> but these were very, you know, these, these girls, the gals, they were all young, you know. What the our, our US did was to go to all the nursing schools and they say, if you will sign up to be an army nurse, we'll pay all your tuition and everything and give you an allowance. That's what they did. So they, they, uh, but they were good because they would come down every day to our decks where we could go and walk around, you know, and you know, talk to the troops and so on. Uh, but uh, this was January of 1944. And uh, 
they, they had really uh, got after the German submarines, but they're still out there. And that, then they had come out with a new type of submarine called a snorkel submarine. See, a submarine had, operates underwater, but it's got a surface in order to charge its battery at night. But the snorkels run this tube up and they suck in well, air for the diesel engine on one side and blow out the exhaust on the other. They didn't have to surface. Later on, I, uh, many years later, I got a hold of a book written by a German submarine commander <coughs> called Iron Coffins. And at the time we went across there, there were 20 German submarines out there. 20, 20 of them. And uh, you look down at that Atlantic in January, and I, and I tell you, you were not going to last very long there. There were uh, three piles of 50 men of, of uh, life rafts, each, each would hold 50 men, piled 10, 10 high on the decks. If the ship went down, they would float free and, you know, hopefully you'd get on, but you wouldn't last very long out there in, that, in the temperature of that water and, and so on. Uh, there was something out there because it went, uh, halfway across two British destroyers showed up, one on either side of us, uh, and uh, were, were zigzagging all the time. Every 20 seconds they would zigzag. That is our ship. And uh, uh, we could hear the depth charges being uh, fired out there because my bunk was below the water line. And when they would drop those depth charges, that thing would hit the side of the ship like you're inside a drum, you know. Uh, it would bang on the side of the ship. And we had to stand by our bunks with life jackets on for 12 hours. And I never knew what this was all about. But uh, I, I envisioned uh, some German submarine commander with Hitler pinning the air and cross with diamonds on him for sinking the West Point. <laughs> <laughs> but we got there. We didn't. We got there. We would come around through St. George's Channel, north of Ireland, and into the Mersey River and up to Liverpool, Victoria Docks in Liverpool. And uh, uh, a, a, a British destroyer went by and they all, all the ships saluted it. I, I wonder what that was all about. They said, well, that's the British destroyer Consac, which uh, became famous in the guarding the convoys around to Russia because it went in close to a German cruiser and, and, and fired, kept firing torpedoes and the Germans couldn't bring their guns down to hit it. <laughs> so the whole ship got the Victorian Cross or some, something, did they, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> it took quite a while to unload us off the <coughs> ship. 7,700, 7, you know, to go off. And I, probably five or six hours later, our turn came, and we got off and got on a train, and there's a tunnel under the Mersey River there. Uh, and all the British uh, engines are steam engines, not electric or anything. But he, and the, whatever happened, we stopped right in the middle of that tunnel. And I thought we were going to get asphyxiated. The whole the smoke from the engine, <laughs> you can't hardly, we come out of there, we had uh, uh, on our face, you know. We were there for about half an hour. And we went out to a, a little station out 20 miles from Liverpool at a place called Beeston Castle. And uh, uh, there was an old ruins of an old castle there. And uh, we're about 15 miles from uh, Chester. And Chester was an old town uh, founded by the Romans. It was actually a Roman wall around it, built by the Romans. And we take over this British army camp. And uh, it, it was <laughs> not in very good shape. Uh, uh, quite dirty, in fact, and so on. And, uh, but we moved in there. And uh, uh, these men, the second infantry division was an old regular army division which had stayed in existence between World War I and II. Its home was Fort Sam Houston, Texas. And it was, it didn't, it didn't have a full complement, but it would have been there. And said these men that uh, were in it, many of them had been in the army 10 or 12 years. You know, it wasn't uh, in the Depression, a uh, Spanish-American guy from that, from Texas, could enlist in the army for $30 a month and get an allowance for his family, you know. And it wasn't too bad. I mean, uh, a lot of the non-coms were, were Spanish, uh, <coughs> Spanish Americans. They were born in the United States. They weren't from somewhere else. And, uh, 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 but they would go into Sparta, Wisconsin, the nearest town there, and they, 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 on the weekend they'd drink a little tequila. And, uh, and then they'd start fighting. <laughs> I actually, we actually had to set up an aid station in the, in the police station in Sparta, Wisconsin. 
on the weekend. And the worst part about it was, I think that everybody in Sparta that had a daughter would send her to visit relatives on the weekend. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty hard to find any young ladies around there. You, you get into Sparta, Wisconsin, there was more troops there than there was back in the camp, you know. But, as you know, it was all right. And uh, uh, <coughs> then, um, well, uh, 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 wait a minute. I, I mean, that's supposed to be in England. Uh, that's behind us. Um, in, uh, <coughs> They, they're, what they're doing with these troops is uh, keeping them in uh, my, uh, good physical condition. Uh, they had a rifle range there, a range. They had some un artillery uh, positions. And uh, <clears throat> then they moved this the whole division down into Wales uh, about uh, April or May <clears throat> for uh, training on what they call the Slapton Sands. Now the British, uh, who would the British Navy and the British people, and uh, seagoing people, and they knew all about this area. The Slapton Sands on the south coast of England was very similar to the coast of Norway, of, of uh, France, where we're going to land, where Omaha Beach is, Normandy. So they, they practiced landing there on the Slapton Sands. Uh, uh, a tragedy happened there. That <coughs> They put them in these LCTs, landing craft tanks. They come in, drop the thing down, and they dash off uh, up the sands. There's supposed to be a British destroyer there guarding this thing while it goes out. <coughs> and uh, for some reason or other, unknown to even to me, the British destroyer went into Plymouth, which is nearby, for some repair or something, and left these landing craft. A German uh, torpedo boats came from the islands of Guernsey and Jersey and torpedoed these landing craft. 800 men lost their lives. Mm -hmm. I don't know what division that was. It wasn't ours, but that is what it happened. When our men do it, there's all, there's <laughs> all kinds of Navy ships out there guarding it. But I, and I've never heard, any, I never saw any writing about that, you know, and, and, and so on, but it actually happened. Uh, <clears throat> then we, uh, after, uh, in Wales, it was kind of nice there. Uh, my job was to, when the men went out to march, uh, uh, was to get the one of the battalion eight station jeeps and follow them along, you know, in case some of them got sore feet or something, they'd come over and I could paint their feet with d tough skin. And I had a, v a very nice friend, a, a young man from Mitchell, South Dakota, you know, the corn capital, the corn oh, palace yep. there. And uh, this, this, he was just a, principal guy, but he had bad feet. He had bad feet. And uh, he suffered. And uh, I told him, I, with this Jeep uh, behind, I told him, now, if you, your feet start to hurt, break, signal me, and I'll pick you up in the Jeep, you know, and, and I'll treat him and take his shoes off and whatever I could do. And uh, uh, that helped him a lot. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, an officer came along and said, to him, said, is this man malingering? I said, no, sir. He's got bad feet and I'm in charge of him. I'm treating him. Uh, you know, the Army, we found out they had certain... One, one uh, thing we, I learned was there's no such thing as a man half sick. You're either well or you're sick. <laughs> and if you're sick, then you're going to get treatment. Put you in the station hospital. I got a little touch of the flu there in Camp Grant. My throat was sore, I was spitting up a little blood, and they, I went on sick call, they, they took me over to the station hospital, about 8 or 9 o'clock at night. I wasn't too bad, I went, went to bed, uh, about 4 o'clock in the morning, they turned the lights on, and here comes a guy down through between the beds, he's got a big cart with mop pails on it, and mops, and he's yelling, get out and mop the area around your bed. <laughs> so. When he come to me, I got out and grabbed a mop and a pail and mop around him. <laughs> and then, but anyway, I was uh, I was there four or five days, I guess, and I went back to the regular regular uh, barracks there. But uh, uh, so, uh, if, <clears throat> and if we're in a certain sense, uh, a medic <clears throat> he might have to consult with his uh, battalion surgeon if he said a man was something was wrong with him. Uh, an officer would be very hesitant to disagree with that, you know. There was almost a chance that somebody might uh, use that to get out of 
duty, particularly when they were in the front line. But a medic was trained to uh, uh, determine whether that was true. And you can tell whether somebody is really sick or not. First of all, if you get any kind of fever, and that's a sure sign, or uh, his, his complexion. Uh, you know, uh, they can't fool you too, too much. They might try it, but uh, then the medic you know, he consults his platoon uh, leader, the lieutenant, and says, this man's got to go back. I recommend he go back to the aid seat. We had cases of uh, mild pneumonia, uh, sore throats, uh, coughing. In a frontline position, you don't want a guy coughing all the time. Uh, so, you, we, you know, <coughs> the, best, the best treatment for a man like that was to uh, put him in a tent with a bed and some blankets and let him sleep for about 24 hours. And that would kill him pretty much. Uh, so where'd you go from slaps and stands? Oh, we went, pardon me, we went to, to into uh, uh, Southampton in the staging area, Southampton. We're locked in, can't get out. Uh, uh, we, we discovered, the medics discovered that there was a problem in the U.S. Army. And that is the, uh, in, after the fighting in North Africa and Sicily and Italy, they had, they had uh, developed a formula that they needed one unit of whole blood for every three units of plasma. That turned out to be completely untrue. We really needed two to three units of whole blood for th three units of plasma. Where are you going to get it? The British couldn't give it. They said, yeah, they were giving it to their own army, you know, and so on. Uh, so what they did was to set up collecting points in Washington, uh, Philadelphia, New York, Boston, all the way up the East Coast. They would collect the blood, they would put it in refrigerated boxes and take it to a four-engine plane in Limestone, Maine, and he would fly every night to John O'Groat in Scotland, which is British Airfield in Scotland, and the RAF Mosquito Bomber, a light one very fast, would pick up this and wheel it right into the landing strips in Normandy. We were putting whole blood in wounded soldiers in Normandy 24 hours after it was collected. Mm -hmm. So, well that, uh, uh, so from Southampton. <coughs> yeah, Southampton, we get on a, a, a smaller troop ship, a British uh, HMS Chantilly. Uh, uh, it was a French liner that had been taken over by the British. Uh, when the Germans took over France, uh, anybody could get out of there and did. And the, a lot of them ended up in British ports and so on. The Chantilly was a small troop ship. We had 3,000 men on there, one regiment. Uh, it had an English crew and the Indian, English officers and Indian crew, India, from India. And uh, it had been taking British troops to India and so on. But uh, in Normandy, they uh, we don't take us. Uh, we get on there. Uh, in the back of the ship, on the fantail, I guess they call that, are two jeeps full of uh, uh, cases. This is the supply and equipment for a battalion aid station. Here are instruments and uh, compresses, uh, morphine, everything we're going to need if we take get a candidate. Um, you know, uh, soldiers, when they went over to Europe on a troop ship, they didn't take anything, all they took with them, they took their helmet, and they took their bag, and their clothing, and so on. They, all the equipment, their, their rifles, their artillery, everything was picked up in England. That had been brought over by the cargo ships, and so on. <laughs> in fact, there was a joke over there, they thought England was going to sink. <laughs> and so, you go up and down the road, and every hundred yards, there's a great big wooden pallet full of artillery shell, and so on. And, uh, or part tanks, uh, or all equipment, and so on. Uh, and then they, they would pick up the rifles and everything. And, uh, we picked up chest, medical chest, and had a stencil on them that said, uh, Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, 1918. They were from the First World War. And stored, but there was good equipment, very top-notch equipment in there, you know, all covered by uh, uh, grease and stuff, you know, ready. But it was all good. They got a hell of a it was over from the First World War. And, uh, well, uh, when we, we, uh, we move out of Southampton, and here's uh, <coughs> ships all over the place. <laughs> Everybody loves their ships. Uh, and we uh, get in, start moving very slowly towards uh, France, and uh, 
what was actually out there was, um, was unbelievable firepower. <coughs> there were 12 battleships, mostly British, with 14-inch guns. And there were 162 <coughs> cruisers, again, mostly British, uh, with 8-inch uh, guns, and 162 destroyers with 5-inch guns. You know, the, the medical, the uh, Navy contingent of taking us over there, landing us, and so on. And uh, uh, we're in 5th Corps with three divisions. Second, the 1st Infantry Division and the 29th. The 29th was the Maryland Virginia National Guard outfit. And somebody, probably the Corps commander, had selected the 29th and the 1st to make the landing at Omaha Beach. We were in reserve. <laughs> if we, we had been chosen to be first, I probably wouldn't be here talking. I might not be here talking to you. And uh, they landed. Uh, uh, of course, they were bombing the daylights out of them and shelling uh, uh, shore. And uh, uh, their whole strategy was to isolate Nor Normandy, we'd knock out the bridges, uh, isolate it. So, so, so the Germans, if they got replaced or uh, reinforcement, they had to walk there. They couldn't get there any other way, which they did. I talked to German prisoners that, that walked the last hundred miles to get there. The bridges were all knocked out and so on. Well, uh, we didn't land. We learned the third day. And uh, uh, Major, and he's now a Major, but, but he keeps saying to me, Brown, you keep, you, you're in charge of those Jeeps back there. If we, if we get in there and we just have to take casualties, we've got nothing to work with. And he, he keeps telling me this. And I said, sir, what happens if the ship gets sunk? He says, you go down with it and keep your eye on the Jeeps. <laughs> <laughs> he had a sense of humor, but he was a very nice uh, country, country type doctor. And, it's kind of strict, but uh, well, when we get over there and uh, uh, they start landing us, which was a British barges, motorized barges, they came alongside and they would hold 200 men. So we put 200 men down there and they, they climbed down a rope net on the side of the boat. And when my time came, I had already made sure they got those jeeps off and put them in the back of the boat. They were all right. They, lifted them off and dropped them in the back of that barge. So I knew they were there all right. And then at my turn, I come down, <laughs> climb down this rope net, uh, ladder, or whatever. it's a light rope about that big. And I look down there and that, that barge, one minute it's about three feet below me, and the next minute it's about 12 feet below me. You know, going up and down like that. And uh, I thought, my God, I don't want to start the war with broken ankles. So uh, <laughs> I waited. I tried to time it, the guy above me is kicking me in the head, telling me to get going. And, uh, but I waited till that thing started up, and I jumped, and I about three or four feet, and I was all right, and, and so on. But uh, that's what we had to do. And uh, so we landed, and uh, <clears throat> the troops are moving. Uh, the engineers, were there. the Germans have moved back. They're probably at least three or four, maybe five miles to get away from this Gun, this naval gunfire, which uh, frankly nothing could survive, in my opinion, uh, and uh, uh, so there's none Germans on the beach. There were some uh, dead ones and some prisoners with the barbed wire around, and uh, so we uh, are moving up there to a, a bivouac area, uh, and uh, I'm driving this jeep up a sandy little road, and uh, I had to stop. There was another road, and I looked over to the right here. And I, I saw my first real war because there was a tarpon there with six pair of feet sticking out under it. They were paratroopers that had, they had paratrooper boots and they had been killed. See, they jumped the night before. They, dropped, they jumped at 12.30 the night before. I mean, the next, first night. And uh, they came down all over the place. <laughs> we were having uh, paratroopers coming out through our lines a week later. They, they dropped them four miles inland, you know. They, and, and then the, the gliders had come over. The glider infantry had come over uh, later and landed. And the, the Germans tried, they knew they were coming, so they had, they had taken uh, parts of trees, you know, and planted them in all the field. They called it Rommel Asparagus, uh, after Field Marshal Rommel, who was the head of it. Uh, and some of these gliders, they had to land, because when they cut them loose, they got no engine. So they got they they got to come down. Some of them had the wings knocked off by these 
wooden things that they planted there, you know. Very dangerous, you know. Uh, but most of them got down. And uh, uh, our first experience uh, was, uh, uh, was getting bedded down for the night. And uh, <coughs> I got a couple of blankets and I put them under the Jeep. It was uh, no rain or anything. And uh, uh, just getting dark. And all of a sudden, it was the darnest noise you ever heard. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, we, they called it, we called it a screaming Mimi. What it was was German rockets. The Germans had a, a, a rocket launcher with six barrels. And it had vents in the nose. And when that rocket would fire, this uh, air going through those vents just made a terrible screeching noise. The GIs called it the screaming Mimi. <laughs> screaming Mimi. And it landed somewhere up there. And uh, then it was getting dark, and I heard quite a bit of shooting, rifle shooting. <coughs> Over here to the left, there was a wooded area there, there and uh, we wondered what's going on there. Uh, and uh, so we both kind of wandered over there, and they had shot three German snipers out of the trees there. They had wooden boards running through the trees, and there were snipers up there, and they, they found them. And a sniper, a German sniper's life is going to be awful short, <laughs> I tell you, if they find him. And well, uh, we moved up, a, few, a couple of days later, we moved up to our place in the line. There had been a British uh, commando unit, force commando, screening the area between Omaha Beach and the British. See, the British landed two divisions and the Canadian Army one, and we had three. And uh, uh, we moved in the line. We encountered something that uh, nobody had said anything about, and that was the hedge rows. These little fields with uh, dirt thrown up around them. It goes back to European history of the Middle Ages, where if a man died, his oldest son got, uh, his sons got the land, you know. So he kept splitting it up in little fields, you know. <coughs> then, they, then later on in the Middle Ages, or later, they passed what they call the primogeniture law, in which it all went to the oldest son. By that time, all there's all the, these fields were anywhere from three to five, eight acres in size, with a mound of earth around, up, and uh, uh, what I call uh, vegetation, with prickers on it, sticking out of the top, the hedgerow. And I tell you, that was very difficult to, to deal with because uh, you can't see anything. Uh, you're kind of protected by these wo uh, wooden things that they've thrown up and the, ha the hedges are so thick that a cow could not walk through them without getting all scratched up. And uh, uh, the Germans would dig in behind these hedgerows. You couldn't see them. And, uh, you, uh, if a tank tried to go up and uh, have to go over the hedgerow, the Germans had a 57 millimeter anti-tank gun, which just, the tank was lightly armored on the bottom, <laughs> and they knocked the tank out. But our men, the American soldier, was a very, uh, what do I want to say, uh, he, he, he would think for himself. Uh, Ingenious. Inge yeah. Uh, one of the ordnance uh, companies, uh, looked at all these beach ob obstacles, you know, that stick up uh, by the beach, uh, and some of them had uh, mines on them, and they said, uh, why don't we use those? They took them with the torches, they cut them up, and they welded them on the front of the tanks, like a rake, you know, sticking out there about 15 inches. So when the tank came up to the hedge row, they would dig in, they gun the engine, and push that hedge row right out. And the, on the top of the tank is a crew member with a uh, tank is open. There's a railing around there, and he's got a 50 caliber machine gun, and she can go all the way around, you know. And he, he's spraying the hedgerow <laughs> with that 50 caliber machine gun, and the infantry squad comes right along behind him and fans out. That's the way they took those fields. That's how they did it. And there was no army regulation to tell you, or nothing you could. There was, <coughs> and that's. The American soldier was, uh, he doesn't like to be told, <laughs> he doesn't really like to be told too much. To, you know, the British Army, they said, and they were good and very good, but they operated almost strictly by the book, you know, and, and regulation. Of course, they went way back to the uh, rebel. You know, the British, uh, uh, I mean, <coughs> British people, <coughs> uh, they, they, this was their fifth year of war, 1939. Uh, 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 we went into a restaurant in Chester one night, and the only thing they had to eat was beans and toast and tea. That's all they had. 
come on. Uh, the British are, are good, very good, but they, you know, they said, you know, we like the Americans, and we're sure glad they're here, but there's four things wrong with them. One is that they overfed, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. <laughs> <laughs> but we got along good with them, and by now, the British, you know, they had their own army, and Burma and India and uh, Africa, uh, after they run around, uh, bring Germans up. <coughs> Finally, after uh, 60 some days, uh, the Allies, uh, High Command, Eisenhower, they, <coughs> they decided what they wanted to do, how to break out of there. We had captured the town of San Lo. We, my division did, but two others, three others did. That was a road junction. Five roads coming in and out of there. Uh, and uh, there was a road running from San Lo over to Pierre's, another town on the coast. What they did, <coughs> they, they marked out an area five miles long and three miles deep to the south. They sent over 900 B-17 bombers, each, each carrying eight 500 pound bombs, and, and carpet bombed that area. Uh, <clears throat> now, you, the, uh, the trouble was that after the first flights of bombers went over, there was so much smoke and dust down there, the rest of the planes couldn't tell where the thing's road was. And they actually dropped their bombs in the wrong place. They killed and wounded 300 American wow. soldiers, wow. including a lieutenant general who was up there observing. But the, the German soldiers over there in that area, uh, with, I mean, they, they were running around with blood coming out their ears, out their nose, out their eyes, out their belly button. The concussion must have been absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Even where I was, the ground shook. And I was over east of San Lo. But that, and then the 3rd Armored Division and the infantry dashed through that area. And what well, was the breakup? On the, I think the 26th of, Ju of, of uh, July. Uh, <clears throat> most of them swung to the east. And, and Patton now had come with the Third Army, and he uh, went through that breakthrough and turned east, and they pinned the German army between the British and Canadians coming down from the north and the Americans that had turned east. We, we went west, and <clears throat> three divisions went west. Uh, when I say a division, there's normally 18,000 men in the infantry division. Uh, we, we went over to capture Brest on the west coast of France because we had, at that point we had no port. There was no port. Everything's coming in over the beaches. The British had captured Antwerp and we couldn't use it because the Germans controlled the islands leading into Antwerp there. And they had artillery on these islands. So if a ship tried to come up there, the artillery would destroy it. There's 150 ships out in the channel waiting to unload. They couldn't get in, so on. The Canadian Army, bless them, the Canadian Army cleaned, cleared all those islands one by one. And we sent one, one division, 104th Infantry, and a Timberwolf Division to help. A good friend of mine was wounded there uh, on one island, which was a Dutch island, Bergen op Zoom, and uh, uh, just died a year or so ago. Got three uh, the shell uh, wounds are funny. Uh, this guy got a shell hit 20 feet behind him put three pieces of shrapnel on his back and killed a man 50 yards away. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> as medics, uh, uh, what our job is, uh, the infantry's up there uh, <coughs> fighting the German troops, uh, either by advancing, or artillery fire, or uh, any way you could do it, and uh, men are getting wounded. Our job in the battalion aid station is to get that wounded man back to the battalion aid station where he can be treated. Now there are medics with each infantry company in platoon, but they have to stay with the troops. They can't stay there and take care of this man. We have to get him somehow and get him back to that aid station, which is about a quarter mile to three quarters of a mile back, see? Uh, sometimes we can load him on a jeep and get him back. When it got to the battalion, and I, I was involved in this, and we took turns, uh, the first thing we got to do was determine, uh, the, the medic that had treated him first puts a, a blue t a plastic tag on him with a wire so it doesn't get torn off, and he puts on there what he did. Uh, uh, 
tourniquet, perhaps, uh, uh, morphine, uh, and so he puts on and, and what he's done so, so that we won't give the guy more and more pain, which we might kill him, you know. Uh, you, uh, uh, <coughs> I, I was a pretty uh, 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 medica. <coughs> there are three types of very wounds where the man might die. One is a belly wound, a thoracic chest wound, or a hip wound. If he get hit in the extremities, chances are he's got a pretty good chance of surviving, because you can almost stop the blood. These medics, including me, uh, carry the kit in which in there are some little hemostats, either plastic or metal. And if you get a bleeder, you just go in the wound and clamp that bleeder off, and so on. And you get a tight complex on it. <coughs> in England, in England, before the invasion, uh, Major Byland and the other three, two battalion surgeons uh, decided that the medics needed some more training. So who does he choose to get the training? It's myself and Sergeant Blasco, the guy from Marquette. <laughs> so we got these medics out there in the open space there. And uh, uh, I, you know, I'm 19, 20 years old. I taught in that one room school, but I'm no expert in how to teach adults, you know. And uh, Blasco helped me a lot. What I do is take a medic and I put him out there about 50 yards. And I put a sign on him. It says, sucking wound to the chest. All right, I said, go treat him. The guy goes over there. He said, what, what, what should I do? I said, Dad, you better do something pretty quick. He's going to be dead in about 10 minutes. Yeah. You ought to do something. Well, the, the treatment is to get a tight compress on there. I mean, get, keep the see if, if you get hit in the chest and you, you're still breathing, that air is going in and out. It's going in and out. I mean, you, and maybe some germs with it. You've got to get a tight compress on there. And so on. Uh, but, uh, so where did you go from? What happened in Brest? We captured. We captured him. Okay. Uh, after about three weeks. Sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I apologize. I'm jumping. You're doing there. well. You're doing well. <laughs> Keep at it. Well, at Brest, uh, as a city, and uh, what was in there was SS troops and submarine crews, and they they are tough people. The German army. Let me say this to the German people. The German army fought a war pretty much <coughs> in accordance with the Geneva Convention. They would not shoot at medics, they didn't saw them. Uh, they didn't ab abuse prisoners. The SS troops, and it's hard to explain who the SS were. Originally, the, the first SS battalion was Hitler's bodyguard. And they were all big, blonde hair Germans, you know. And they, they propagandized the, the party. See, the, uh, the German, the Nazi party, uh, when it got in power in 1933 and didn't want any opposition of any type, uh, used the Jews as a uh, swimming boy, you know, and uh, all kind of propaganda. We uh, tried to develop hatred for the Jews. Uh, and uh, the SS, they just kept on enlarging the SS. Uh, I mean, these are the real Germans, the real, this is a German race. Uh, actually, a lot of German soldiers were not anything like that. I once had uh, two wounded German soldiers in the battalion aid station, and uh, they were slightly wounded, and we were going to send them to the... But uh, for some reason or other, I had a uh, five-gallon can of hard candy. Where it came from or why it... I think it was to give to a wounded soldier he could suck on. But uh, they were helping me a little bit, so I gave, I gave each one of them a big handful of that hard candy. They had these long overcoats on, they put it in there. Those son of the guns, before they left there, they stole half that candy. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta watch those Germans. <laughs> well, they filled up their pockets with these overcoats. They filled up their pockets. So, so Brest fell on, or captured uh, Brest on the 19th. 19th of September. We, uh, they came over and bombed it. Uh, this was a bad situation because it would be fighting house to house. You know, it, it's a town. And buildings are right next to each other, and you can't tell where anybody is. Uh, at one point, they notified uh, me that there were two wounded men in a building about a quarter mile up, in a brick building, three-story brick building, and could we go and get them? So I, I, went, I got three other guys and two litters, and we started out from there. We got there all right, and uh, uh, checking over the wounded, and. There's some infantrymen in there with their rifles, and they seem to be quite tense. 
And I said to him, I said, where's the crowds? You know, we, we, I have to confess, we never talked about the Germans as the Germans. They were always crowds. I guess that comes from sauerkraut or something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I said, where's the crowd? They said, in, in the third story of this building. And I said, oh, I, I, they, had, they, they had knocked holes in the walls of these buildings next to put run down planks, and they go through six or seven buildings. And I thought, my God, how am I, how are we going, if they're SS troops, how am I going to get these two guys out of here? You know? Because they shoot, and they ask, if they're SS, they're going to, sh they don't give a damn, they shoot their own mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could tell you, I, uh, but I told these two guys, well, one of them, and I'm the other, we got to go down the, right next to the buildings on either side of this road street. And if you hear anything, duck, duck in the doorway of a building, as quick as possible. But evidently they were gone because we, they didn't, nobody shot at them. Mm -hmm. got them back, but, uh, so after Brass, where'd you go? Well, we were there for a few days, uh, uh, and then <coughs> we were loading up in trucks to move back across France to Belgium. I'm, I'm throwing you. No, you're doing well. It's right in front of you. You're doing. You're right on. Well, we're moving back. The front is now <coughs> in Belgium. The, uh, the Germans had a ter uh, the German trying to get out through this corridor, which was seven miles wide, and uh, our fighter bombers. <coughs> we had a plane called the Thunder uh, Thunderbolt, a P-47 Thunderbolt. That was a killing machine. Uh, it had six 50, uh, 350 caliber machine guns in each wing. It had six rockets under each wing. And it could carry a 500-pound bomb under each wing. Had a big radio engine, you know. Uh, and they just came in there over the treetops and just riddled these, these columns of German. Uh, there was some German wax in a, in a car. And one guy was telling me that when he went through there, they're, they're dead in this staff car, uh, that machine gun. There were over 12,000 dead in that roads leading through that gap in their line. But there's quite a few... Uh, uh, You're talking about the Battle of the Bulge? Well, uh, that, had, that came a couple of months or two later. Okay. Uh, we went into Belgium, got up there, and there was an area of 18 miles where there was not much going on. Kind of a quiet area. We were holding that area, and there's nothing going on much. There was just some patrolling out there every day, but the main fighting was north of us around Aachen in the Ruhr River. They're trying to get across the Ruhr River. And uh, uh, nothing, we, we told them uh, later we would hear tank engines running on the other side of the river. And uh, of course, the Germans had taken quite a beating. <laughs> and uh, we told the officers, and they said, no, nah, they don't have any tanks over there. They've recorded these, and they're playing them on loudspeaker. Uh. <laughs> that turned out not to be true. There was a lot of tanks, so we were getting ready. You know, uh, uh, up at Aachen, they tried to get across the Ruhr River, and uh, two towns over there, Jewitz and Gurn. But the Germans, there were three dams on the Ruhr River, River. and uh, this is an industrial area: Dortmund, uh, Dusseldorf. Here's the big Krupp steel works, the uh, steel, other steel company. IG Farm. This is the number one industrial area of Germany. And uh, every time I put bridges across there to Aachen, the Germans would open up the dam and water would come out and uh, carry away the bridge. <laughs> so we were pulled out of there and sent up north to take the dams on the Ruhr River. And we were replaced by a new division just come from the United States, the 106th Infantry Division. And they moved in there and were gone and we were making progress towards these dams when the Germans struck right through where we'd been. They overran this 160, captured two complete regiments, 6,000 reserves, and uh, uh, we had to stop and turn around, go back 12 miles, and line up on the north side of this bulge. There's a place there called the Elsenborn Ridge, and, uh, and we lined up there and kept the Germans from going any further there, but they, you have a map of that. Yep, right here. Battle of the Bulge is right here. There's Aachen. Well, they got behind us about 25, 30 miles. 
Yeah. But they tried to, there's a river, the Mears River. And all our big dumps were on that west side of that river. They, they were, their plan was to get over the river and get the gasoline from these dumps. But they never got there. So they ran out of gas. Their tank. They had some very big tanks that I, I don't mean anything when I say a German tank for an American, a German tank was better. I mean, it had better armor, it had better guns, and so on. But we, the German tanks were all diesel engines. American tanks were all gasoline engines because we didn't have the diesel technology, you know, uh, so on. In fact, the tankers referred to it, and it was a good tank, it did its job, but the, the tankers referred to a Sherman tank as the Blue Torch. Once a shell hit that thing in that gas, 50 gallon gasoline tank, we better get out of there quick. So, and, but uh, the, the, the Germans had to abandon their equipment and go to walk by golf. I mean, they just ran out again. And, uh, ran out of fuel. And, but they, uh, at that point, it, it brought about a change in the attitude of American soldiers. Uh, because they did, uh, the SS troops overran an artillery, a couple of artillery batteries who were on the road moving. And they, they captured them. And they, they lined them up in the snow. This is December, in the snow. And they backed a truck up there, German Army truck. They took away the canvas. There's a machine gun there. They, they mowed down 126 of them, mm -hmm. these artillery, known as the Melmondy Massacre. When, when we drove them out of there, finally, and the troops, American troops went in there and found 126 bodies under the snow. Yeah. Frankly, the average soldiers had it, and they found out about it. The average soldier attitude changed. Uh, and I probably was un. un uh, it had to. When we find out that 126 of our men have been machine gunned in the snow, three or four of them played dead and got out of there, told the whole story, mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, the, the people that did that, the, uh, the German colonel by Piper, Piper, they got a hold of him and his men from had done this. They put him on trial after the war and uh, uh, executed some of them. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> well, uh, so we're back here holding the north flank of the bulge and they're gradually pushing, uh, pushing them back out of there. By, by the end of January, we had them back pushed out of there. One of these boys, the three boys that went with me, was a sergeant in another infantry outfit. And when they pushed him back, and while he flowers, and uh, he had gone up there with a patrol to locate where the Germans were. And they, he, they captured a German sitting on a log going to the toilet. <laughs> they brought him back to the headquarters. And uh, because of that, they asked Wally, my friend that went in the army with me, to lead a combat patrol up there. And he was on his way up there and a German sniper shot him. And fortunately, he had a, an address book in his pocket with a metal cover. And that bullet hit that and went and was diverted somewhat. Otherwise, it probably killed him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was sent home and uh, had to have some opera. Went through part of his liver, and uh, uh, he, he came out all right. Uh, he was treated in a hospital in Ohio and uh, became a teacher like I was, and uh, died here just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. he was a retired teacher from Western Michigan. So on. And I, I see him quite a few. Uh, he had the bullet they took out. Uh -huh. uh, you went from Battle of the Bulge to where? Battle of the Bulge, we, uh, we pushed the Germans out of there. We went uh, east, and uh, there was a uh, dumber development of the Ruhr, the industrial area. The Ninth Army went around to the north. First Army that we were in went around to the south. And we actually penned in about 200 and some thousand German troops in the Ruhr pocket. So on. And uh, they surrendered. Mm -hmm. And their, their, their commander, uh, Field Marshal, shot himself. Oh. Uh, Field Marshal, uh, I forget his name, but uh, we were there a week or so, and my job then was to take the Jeep, <laughs> one of the Jeeps, and go in the, into this rural area and uh, had a German soldier with me who spoke English, an interpreter, and uh, there was German medics in there in field hospital because they had no bandages. They were using paper. They were using paper for the wound and so on. Mm -hmm. And we gave them a couple truckloads of bandages and so on. And they, they were 
They were going, they, at first they were very few, they were not guarded really. I mean, they, at night they could have sneaked out, but they were happy to be out of the war, I guess, and stayed there. And, uh, uh, so you want, so well then the Battle of the River Pocket is over. And, uh, uh, we were detached, the Fifth Corps was detached to, uh, to, on the left flank of the uh, Third Army, which is Patton's Army. The, the fear was, I found out what this was all about, was that they were afraid the Germans, large numbers of troops are going to retreat south, get up in the German Elk, the German mountains, and hole up there, and that they had supplies there. That never happened, but they didn't know it was going to happen. So we were advancing across Germany uh, uh, in a southeasterly direction. Uh, I know we were near the town of Erfurt, and, and uh, Major Byler, one, one evening he called me uh, Brown. No, he called me <laughs> Brown. <laughs> it's all right. He said, tomorrow morning, uh, you've got to take a jeep and a couple of medics and go up here about two miles. There's a big crossroad. And he said, we don't know who's there. We've got some infantry up there, in the, uh, around there, but we don't know who's there. And uh, so I, before daylight, without turning many lights on the jeep, I went up there. When I get up there, there's American soldiers around there, infantry, and they, all, they had taken their com compresses, their bandages, out of their, where they're carried, put them over their face and tied it behind you know, with a tail. And I thought, that's funny. <laughs> Why are they doing that? And uh, I, the only thing I could think of, I used to see pictures of the Japanese, you know, with putting a mask on to keep them getting the flu. And then I began to sniff a little bit, and there was unmistakable smell of human flesh. We were just outside of the Buchenwald concentration camp, <coughs> which is right there. <coughs> and there, they said, they told me that there were 1,500 decaying bodies in there. That's what they told me. I never, I didn't go in there because my job is to man that station in case we had anybody injured or shot. But, uh, uh, so one, one person that was there was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. No, uh, Bonhoeffer. Right before you got there, he left. No, that, no, uh, that uh, Bonhoeffer was, he was at Flossenburg, another one down. I was confusing Flossenburg with Ghost Rose. Okay. Uh, um, well, uh, we, I never went inside this camp. Uh, we brought up half of the 49th Field Hospital. You could, uh, uh, we had wounded in the aid station, we could split the aid station in two. Take one jeep and go up to save with the troops, while the other one got rid of the eight wounded to the field hospital. Uh, the field hospital is 250 beds under campus. 12 nurses and 12 doctors. And uh, they can split that in two, too. Uh, a regular field hospital has got to be ready to move in two hours. Now, uh, he said there's 12 nurses. Uh, <laughs> uh, these are young gals. The, uh, the commander, the captain nurse, is a little older, but the rest of these nurses are just out of nursing school, practically. And they didn't have a very easy life. They didn't have any toilets. They had slit trenches. They, I guess the engineers would put up a canvas shield around the slit trench you know, for them. But otherwise, they, they slept in the cots and they uh, found that there was a, one electric wire going down through the operating tent with bulbs. And they, there's, there's an operating two of them there and these nurses and doctors are in the mud with their feet operating on these guys and so on, you know. I have great wisdom. <laughs> as far as I know, no, no soldier ever got disrespectful of those nurses. Tried anything. They were good. They, they, they were lieutenants, so they got liquor rations, which they didn't drink, and they gave to our soldiers. <laughs> We'd help them move with their bedroll. You know. So what did you do after Buchenwald? Kept on going east. <laughs> Keep on going. Uh, this is difficult because uh, we had two roads that the uh, troops are following. Later on, we get on the Autobahn, but uh, <clears throat> nobody wants to be the last casualty of the war. You know. We know the Russians are already driving towards Berlin, and we're going east. And uh, uh, what they would do is uh, take two trucks, six by six trucks, 
loaded up with infantry, uh, put a tank, de tank, or tank destroyer ahead, what we call the Chicago piano behind, which is a, uh, a machine, four machine guns and a harness that you can move all four of them and go like the devil for two miles. The infantry would jump out and fan out, see? And they kept doing that, you know, repeating that, called leapfrogging. Uh, we all, also, we were smart enough to have a heavy combat patrol out on either side of these roads because uh, uh, some of the Germans, uh, especially the Hitler youth, they, they had 15, 16, 14 year old boys, usually commanded by some older officer. And uh, they were not beyond shooting in our truck, you know, if the officer told them to shoot in our truck. And on a couple of occasions, you got bullets going through the canvas of these trucks. And it, uh, I don't think they knew we had these heavy combat patrols out there. And uh, they caught one group, and uh, the boys, 14, 15 year old Hitler youth, they just kicked the took their guns and kicked them in the seat of the pants. But the officer that ordered this, they shot him right on the spot. Uh, he was a 50 year old officer. Right? Uh, so who was one of those boys that they sent back? Well, that, as far as I know, they hit him for home. No, but. Remember, one of those boys was the uh, last pope. Oh yeah, towards the uh, end of the war, uh, the po uh, pope retired here. The one that just retired, not yeah. the one that's current, yeah. not the one before that. Yeah, he was a 15-year-old German soldier, mm -hmm. and uh, the way he tell it was, he was sent. He, he and some other boys were at a, a place where there were two tanks, and uh, the Americans started coming from different directions, and the tank crew jumped out and ran, you know. And uh, a big American sergeant grabbed him by the cuff of the neck and went held him and kicked him in the seat of the pants and said, get the hell out of here and go home <laughs> to the former future pope. <laughs> <laughs> so you worked your way all the way over to Krakow. Well, no, first we uh, were on the German <coughs> border for several days waiting for orders. Mm -hmm. We know the Russians are coming from somewhere and the Allied, uh, Hit the Allied Control Commission, both in Net London and Prime Moscow, were determining where the army should meet. And uh, because they didn't want them shooting at each other, you know. And uh, uh, we, we stopped on the German border. Uh, for, I don't know, I can't remember, four, three, four days. And I was just riding around in my Jeep, and I looked at, there was a German airfield there, and I looked down and it looked like a B-24 bomber down there. And it was. I drove down there, and, and the German it had made a uh, crash landing there, and the Germans had taken the engines out of it, but the rest of it was sitting there. <laughs> and I looked at it, and I went up to it, and it had a little plaque on the side, Defense Plant Corporation, Will Run Mission, <laughs> Major Will Run. <laughs> yeah, it was one I worked on, because they hadn't turned them out very much when I was there. And so we were waiting there. <clears throat> And then suddenly we get orders towards night. Now we had heard over the radio that Hitler committed, shot himself. But Hitler was in a bunker, a very big bunker in Berlin with his new wife of several days, Eva Braun, and uh, some of the other Nazi officials. Um, the Russians were in the city and getting closer and closer. In fact, their shells were landing in the grounds of the uh, bunker area. and. Uh, after he was married, they had a little reception, and uh, then he, he he had already given to his SS guards what to do. That was to take both bodies out in the courtyard of the chancery, dig a, a trench, put them in there, and put a soak them with gasoline, set them on fire. But that's what they did. Cover them up, I guess. And uh, uh, that's where the Russians found, found them. So where were you when Germany surrendered? Uh, on the German border, uh, going towards Pilsen. Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. Yes. Mm -hmm. What were you doing with the Russian soldiers when you guys were sitting there waiting? Well, they, we, they weren't around us. They were in Pilsen. They right. were. Uh, you were making an exchange with them, though. What you doing? No, we didn't meet the Russian soldiers till we got to Pilsen. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was, was kind of odd because. The whole western rim of Czechoslovakia is what's known as the Sudeten, Sudeten land. That's, that, there are, those people who live there are Germans. Uh, for about 10 or 12, 15 miles, all around 
is, is a German area, and they were very much pro-Nazi. In fact, well, it's a long story, but when the uh, Chamberlain Hitler agreement, you know, 1938, he, they gave him the Sudetenland. Yeah. They thought he was going to be satisfied. Five months later, we took over the whole country. Uh, well, we're, we, when we went through that German area, there was nothing. There was no lights or nothing. We, uh, when we got to the Czech area, beyond that, the people are full of the streets, there's bonfires going, uh, there's people out there with wine, you know, bottles of wine, you know, greeting us, and, and so on. Uh, we, we, we finally, we get into Pilsen, and the uh, uh, first ones I run into was a, a group of very drunk German, uh, Russian soldiers. I mean, they, they had bottles of vodka, <laughs> and they were staggering around. They insist I take a drink from this bottle, you know, Amer Amerikansky. So I did, and I think, I think they tempered, I think that was come out of a flamethrower or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, they were on one side of the river, we're on the other. Our troops were coming up. And we were in a school. The town of Pilsen itself was not badly bombed. There was a big uh, uh, plant, uh, the, uh, I can't think of the name, uh, a plant outside of town that was bombed. But, and uh, the Russian soldiers would come over on our side were very frequent all the time, any time. And they were all, they'd have a helmet full of eggs, you know, fresh. They took them, from this one, took them from the friend, Czech farmers. And they were, they wanted uh, wristwatches. They're crazy about wristwatches. Mm -hmm. So uh, we didn't give them our wristwatches, but we took the wristwatches off the German prisoner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tra traded them to the, for eggs and so on. But they, uh, uh, and then every morning, here would come a Studebaker truck that we sent to the Russian with Russian um, women MPs, the women MPs, and then big stocky gals, you know, <laughs> and they had rifles, mm -hmm. and they would grab, and they, there's half a dozen Russian soldiers passed out on the sidewalk, and they'd grab them, they'd throw them on the truck and hit them with rifle butts. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd, uh, well, yeah, it was, uh, this went on for about a week, and then all of a sudden, we became aware that the Russians had been given some different orders. They didn't come across on our side, and if you see one and you go up to him and say, hi, how are you, he shake hands and turn and walk away. It was obvious that they had been told not to fraternize with us, and so on, um, so on. But <clears throat> one day while we're there, a Russian officer uh, comes in. He's from the general staff or something because he had a we could tell they had red stripes on his uniform and so on, the shoulder, uh, and he speaks pretty good English. And he's, he's telling us that uh, as they came across Poland and Eastern Germany, they, they uh, came across prisoner war camps, either British or American or uh, Poland, somebody, and he said there's a lot of sick soldiers in those camps, either British or American. He said we, we couldn't, do, couldn't take them with us. We have no way to take them or treat them. And they, he said, he was telling us, you got to figure out how to go and get them. So what we did then, uh, was to get a train, a train of about 10 or 12 cars. The engineers welded some brackets in there to hold the litters. And we started out for one uh, plant that they um, camped near Krakow. And they said this was mostly British prison. So, um, and we had orders from the Russian authorities, written in Russian, which they, most of the Russian soldiers couldn't, <laughs> couldn't read because they're from Siberia or something. And <clears throat> we started out and we were going along pretty good and suddenly they stopped us. And they put the train in a side track. And they surround us with uh, mean looking Siberian troops with submachine gun. And we can't figure out what's going on. Why did they, why did they stop us? And we're there from about noon to about five o'clock. And I thought, well, I've got to get off and stretch my legs a little bit. I stepped out of that car and then that soldier brought that submachine gun right up to my chest. Mm -hmm. I decided I didn't need any exercise. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, and we can't, we don't, we, we have, who are we contact, you know what? Uh, and suddenly we noticed that a whole bunch of these Russian soldiers are lining up by the tracks. And we hear the whistle of a train, quite a nice looking train going slowly through.
through this, through there on the main track. And as uh, uh, soon as that was over, uh, the Russian soldiers dropped their guns and came on our train. We're throwing their arms around it, Tavarovich, comrade, and offered with the uh, booze. And we found out that that was Marshal Kornev's train. He was on his way back to Moscow. And, and they didn't want anything to interfere. <laughs> if anything interfered with that train, somebody's going to get shot. So as soon as that was over, we put our, let's go back onto the main track and we go up to the uh, Czech German border. There's part of Germany, a place called Reichabur. And we uh, go through there and we went on to Krakow. You, you can see part of the city up to the north. And there's a, there's a camp with 500 sick British prisoners of war. Some of them are litter cases. Uh, and we, we take, put them on and get them on the train. I took care of an Irish soldier, Irish full of seers, who had been captured on the Albert Canal in 1940. The strange thing about it was that, uh, to me it was at least, that these German soldiers who had been captured and been prisoners were working on farms, what they had to do it. That they were, they were not bitter and didn't, didn't hate, really exhibit any hate towards the Germans. The, the, the food was bad. The food, uh, food of any prisoners, American or anybody else, uh, was bad. Uh, but they got Red Cross parcels. He said the Red Cross parcels that they got every month really helped them. So we took these uh, English soldiers back to, uh, I think it was Reims, France, and the British took over and took them to the hospital to share them. So you went from, because we're going to have to wrap up here pretty quick here. You went, um, so from, with doing that, you ended up in southern France. What was your plan in southern France at Versailles? We come back to Reims, the whole division got back to Reims. they sorting out, uh, there's a, a point system. You got one point for every month you've been in the Army, two points for every month overseas, five points for uh, um, Purple Heart, five points for Battle Star, Normandy was one, uh, Ben Bones was one. Uh, I had quite a few points, I think 59, 60, but there were men there that had come all the way from North Africa. They screened out the high point men and they were going to go home. The rest of us, are going to go and invade Japan. Uh, we, we, we moved, uh, after they screened, we got replacements coming, yeah. men from right out of the state. And we get on the train, we go down to Marseille, this big station area there. We're going to, uh, the ship is going to take us from Marseille on the 23rd of August to through the Suez Canal, past India, and on to the Philippines where we're going to get ready to invade the southern island of Japan in October. Uh, they, they dropped the bomb on the 6th of August. We are going to sail on the 23rd. They dropped the bomb on Hiroshima <coughs> on the 6th. And then Nagasaki a little bit later. And then, uh, then on the 15th, the, the uh, Japanese accepted the Potsdam terms. So we're not going to go. <laughs> we're not going to go. So just kind of, kind of wrap it up a little bit. Just kind of give an idea. Uh, World War II was from September 1st, 1939, to September 2nd, 1945, when Japan signed the peace treaty. 60 million deaths, 3 percent of the world's population, 20 million soldiers, and 40 million civilians. The U.S. had 291,000 dead, 670,000 wounded. Well, uh, there's kind of a, we found, there's kind of a formula for every man, in the American Army, every man killed outright, there'll be three wounded, right. roughly. Uh, World War II took the lives of 426,000 Americans. So there must have been about a million and a half wounded. Yeah. See that picture on there now? See that picture, you know that guy? <laughs> it's on his wedding day. Oh, wow. One of the things when I asked him about this and what he said that he wanted to convey is that the battle, I mean, there are people that somebody that he knew that got arrested for bootlegging three times and they told him to either go to jail 
We're going to war. Or well, going to the army. My, I, 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 so many different. My immediate crew was nine men, and major battalion surgeon. Uh, one of them was a uh, we call him a hillbilly. He was 38 years old. Been married three times. It was blowing, blowing rot, North Carolina. He must have been on good terms with his ex-wives because they all sent him homemade fruit cakes. <laughs> <laughs> and usually, a man 38 years old with three with uh, four children and married, they wouldn't draft him. You know, they had to pay an allotment to the family. So his name is Carter, and I said to him, I said, Carter, how did they get you in here? You know, how well, he said, it's pretty hard to make a living down there during the Depression. He said, we all got stills running up in the hills, you know. <laughs> and uh, he said, I've been arrested twice before and, uh, by the authorities. But he said, the third time, I came up before the same judge I had before. <laughs> and he took one look at me and he said, Carter, you've got two choices. The state pen is this way, and the army recruiting office is this way. <laughs> he said, I chose that. <laughs> but he was a good soldier. He was uh, uh, one of the best because uh, he was just like an old mother hen. We get a mother, a soldier in there and he's on a litter and he's wounded and he says, I gotta have a bedpan. You know, you, know, you don't stop normal function when you get hit. So uh, I, I look around, <laughs> a couple of guys have taken off, you know. And, but Huck Carter, he runs right over there, uh, takes the man's pants down lifts him up, puts the bedpan under him, you know, and uh, always did exactly, I mean, he, I, uh, that was Carter. Uh, <clears throat> I had another guy who was a very intelligent fellow, he was a private, and uh, uh, I mean, he was smart, and his name was uh, uh, Cantor, and I didn't know it and for a long time, and Cantor was from Chicago. His mother was one of the heirs to the Walgreen fortune. Oh. And he was a private. Never asked anything. Never asked any favor. He just did his job. Now, he did tell me one time, he said, Bob, he says, you ever come to Chicago? Look you me know, up. I imagine he ended up vice president of Walgreen Drug. <laughs> <laughs> but just to remember that of all different types, um, in my research, came across this. Yeah. Wow. Teddy Roosevelt Jr. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. died from his wounds in Normandy mm -hmm. on July 12, yeah. 1944, and was buried in Normandy. Um, this is, I was talking to Ms. Brown when we were wrapping it up. He quoted this sign from memory. You read that, Mr. Brown? You see that? Well, I've been back over there. Um, oh, yeah. Seven. Uh, yes. Uh, I've been back to Europe several times, and I, uh, a couple of times I visited Normandy. Uh, is um, a cemetery. There are 9,383 buried there. And one time I was there, there was a, a sign which said, when you go home, tell them for us and say, for their tomorrow, we gave her today. Okay. I, uh, well, in 1954, when I was, before I was foolish and got married, <laughs> 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 My wife is here. Yes, she is here. <laughs> In August, we've been married 63 years. Oh. Oh. She went to the same college I did. Michigan State Normal College, Nips Lane, Michigan Teachers College. And she worked in the student union. And I ate there sometimes. And she was working there, and I swear she shorted me on the food. <laughs> <laughs> So well, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Um, he has uh, graciously been willing to sit here and do that. Um, we're gonna let him catch his breath, and we got a little. Well, support. one thing went my war. Uh, since the war is over, uh, uh, we went. Uh, we, uh, Major Byland took some of us down to Nice on the Riviera, mm -hmm. opened the clinic there, because yeah. they brought down four thousand soldiers every week for a furlough, and we ran, the only thing you had <laughs> was hangovers here. <laughs> and had to treat, but there were some others. There was a South African Armored Division right over the border in Italy, and they sent some people over there. And uh, I had three or four prisoners of war that shined my shoes, made my bed, 
and we had a good mess sergeant. He, he cooked, we, and uh, uh, we, you could buy a big bottle of grape juice for 50 cents, you know, grape juice. They didn't drink it, they drank wine or something. <laughs> and, uh, then we went back, to this, another crew came in, and the army had, I found out the army had opened three schools, a college type school, one in London, one in Paris, and one over on the Bay of Biscay by the Thames. So I applied for that. And uh, lo and behold, they chose me. I went over to that one by Spain. And this was, they brought professors over from the United States. I had a professor at Michigan State University there. And uh, but this, this, this uh, point system was grinding on. <laughs> it came to me and we got, with some others, we got on a train, go to Paris, and then to the Harvard there a few days, and uh, then the ship comes in, which is a assault transport sea quail, the sea quail, which is a uh, assault transport, they've been landing marines in the Pacific, and they had tw uh, 2,900 of us on there. We got on the sea quail, and we got out in the channel and started for home, <laughs> and uh, we ate one, we ate supper. Uh, when we came up out of supper, the, the crew was stringing, uh, 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 ropes up and down the deck and passing us man to man. We're running into a storm right as we left the channel. And I'm telling you, that was a storm. I mean, uh, in, in March, the worst storms in March. And uh, we never came up out of that hole for three days. And that ship was going uh, going in and going up, just like being on an elevator, going up and down five story like that. And they're sick and they're sick. And I, I was all right as long as I was laying flat in my bunk. They didn't even try to feed us. We had K rations and so on, you know. We had food and water. But as long as I was laying flat in my bunk, I was all right. But if I tried to get up where my my head and my <laughs> my stomach and the water the water came over the ship and got in the hole and it's about a foot deep in that there are slashing back and forth. We had to abandon the lower bunks. There was one poor devil, I don't think he ever got out of that bunk all all trip. <laughs> we brought food to him. <laughs> But we got, on the 26th of March, 1946, having left this storm in the middle of the ocean, beautiful weather, on the 26th of March, the sea quail entered New York Harbor, and we went past the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> and there were not many dry eyes on that ship. A pretty tough man. Pier 52 on the Hudson. We did docked at Pier 52 on the Hudson and unloaded, went across the river, got on the train, went to uh, Cap Chomer, and so on. And then I got another train, went back to Camp McCoy, and was uh, discharged from there. Got paid for all my unused leave. <laughs> About $275. Wow. <laughs> I got on the train to get down to Chicago and there was a man, an adult man, he got talking to me. He was going to open a factory in Chicago. He took me to the dining car and paid for my supper. And uh, I got another train, went back to Michigan. And my brother came and picked me up. And our farm was a quarter mile up this country road. Mm -hmm. and I, I said to him, he came even back from the Pacific. I said, it's a beautiful spring day, April 1st. Mm -hmm. I said, let, let me let me out, let me walk. walk this way. And he did. Mm -hmm. My war was over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.